Beautiful. So today's session is when we're going to get really into the nitty gritty of talking about the ways in which we are having conversations with your children about how is it that they can find and identify the right colleges for them. With so many options out there in the U.S. and abroad, it can become really easy and really overwhelming really quickly to consider how is it or how am I going to find the best colleges out there for me, considering the perspectives and my interests? How is it that I can find communities that are going to validate my experiences and introduce me to new and exciting ones? There's a lot of big questions that your children are asking themselves as they're actively trying to figure out the right schools and the right communities for them. And my hope and intention with today's seminar is to really provide a framework of understanding how we can support our children in this kind of fact-finding mission that they're going through at the moment. Um, and what I presented to them in this version of this session is pretty similar to what I wanna share with you all, but really with an added framework about the kinds of questions and the kinds of supports that you can offer your children as they're engaging in this stage of the, of the process. So, so normally I know that I do a lot of talking in these presentations and I wanna take a second to be a little bit more interactive here. And I'm encouraging you all to answer um, one, of the, one of the two questions kind of depending on your own perspective and your own experiences. So take a second to think about the two questions and then please add in your perspectives to the chat box. So the first question what is, how did you know that your college, whether it was an undergraduate institution or a graduate institution was a good match for you at the time that you were applying and, and considering to go? Or what characteristics will make a good college or uh, will make a college a good fit for your child? So there's no right or no wrong answers here, um, but definitely take a second to just think about it and reflect on your own experiences or reflect on the conversations that you're having currently with your children and then add it to the chat box. I'm just super curious as to the myriad of answers that folks are going to be presenting. Right, so I'm seeing perspectives about the visit. The vibe, I love the question about the vibe because it means everything and nothing at the same time. But time and time again, I talk to students about what made their visit particularly memorable and their answer to me is always, it had a great vibe, right? So I'm sure that this may be a consideration that perhaps you experienced for yourself, perhaps your children have experienced as they engage in campus visits, important to really interrogate that, to really ask them to dig deep into what the vibe is. Is it a feeling? Is it a thought? Is it a program? Or is it the connections that they made, right? There's nothing invalid about that feeling, but it's important to really think about what is it that's underneath that particular feeling. Some of the perspectives were the experience of the community that was engaging, a welcoming school, the connections of the vibe of the school. Absolutely. So just for the interest of time, as we're going on with the presentation, feel free to keep on adding your perspectives. Um, but part of the reason why I asked this question is because there really is no right or wrong answer as students are considering the myriad of considerations that are important for them as they're thinking about colleges. Every student is gonna weigh these considerations really differently. For some, location may be the most important factor. For others, it may be Greek life. For others, it may be the reputation. For others, it may be academic programs. For others, it may be weather. And really, there are no right or no wrong answers here. But what I can assure you is that as students continue to ask these big questions of themselves, and as students become more aware of the opportunities that are out there for them, these considerations are going to get broader and certainly more specific, right? They're really asking themselves, how is it that these schools compare to one another considering the factors that they themselves are considering. And at this stage of the process, what I hope that we all collectively do is give students the breathing room and the space to articulate what their considerations are, 
as they understand them. Some of some students have a really clear understanding of where they see themselves for the next four years, and others are just starting to have that conversations for themselves. So we wanna make sure that we're entering each of these conversations with an open mind and an open heart to help our under students understand that what their considerations hey, are Frank. at this juncture is valid. Yes. I liked your last slide a lot. I was just interested, curious that, you know, and not that it should be a major deciding factor, I guess, but I surprised that cost wasn't up there, you know, because you have such a variability in schools, you know, and, and how, how it can range. Um, just interesting. Yeah, uh, John, that's a, a really, really, really great perspective. I was kind of just doodling around with a word um, generator. I actually pretty surprised I didn't add affordability, but absolutely. Did you use chat GPT? No, this is chat. <laughs> this is chat Frank Cabrera. <laughs> I'm just kind of <laughs> making things things on the fly. But absolutely, affordability is a really, 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 really important factor for so many of our students, right? And it had, and you know, as I've mentioned in individual meetings, and I certainly have, and I will comfortably mention in family meetings, is that I always give students the agency to kind of decide their journey and their factor and their. Um, in the college search process. And I'm not a counselor to typically say no to things. I'm not here to squash dreams. I'm not here to say that they can't do certain things. But I think when it comes to affordability, that's probably one of those factors and considerations that I kind of really draw a hard line on, right? Because there's a lot of great schools that can meet the needs of our students and our families. And we wanna make sure that we're doing our due diligence to identify what that looks like, where that is, and really centering that in our search. Because there's no sense of, a, of getting into vast amounts of debt if we don't have to, and if we can be proactive about avoiding that. Exactly, so, that's so, exactly the point. That's right. Yeah, so John, thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that up. That's a really, really excellent point. And certainly um, another reason why our partnership with um, Paul Martin at College Money Method is so important because we wanna have the, uh, the conversations about affordability for all of our families, ninth through 12th grades, because we recognize that this is a continuous conversation. And affordability shouldn't, shouldn't be a conversation that just starts in a student's 11th grade. This should be a consideration all throughout their journey through Brooklyn Friends so that once we get to senior year, we have a really firm understanding of what that looks like for you and your family, and then we can plan accordingly. So certainly, thank you for bringing that up. That is definitely a factor that's really, really important. But as I, I was saying, at, at this stage for all of our students, I think there's three big buckets that I want to us to all really center. And these are kind of three areas that I know I really hold central to when I'm engaging with students at this stage of the process. And the first is listening and giving your, your child the space to express their hopes and their dreams, allowing them to dream big and doing so without judgment. You know your child and you may have really strong ideas about what's right for them. And trust me, most of them are gonna seek your, seek your opinions and seek your validation. But when they are in the early stages of the college search process, give them the opportunity to articulate their dreams on their own accord, even if they struggle to do so because we want them to feel in control of their destiny. Planting seeds is something that's really, really important at this juncture as well. For those of you who work with me one-on-one, -on -one, perhaps you witnessed and observed that as I'm asking your child questions about their preferences, their hopes and their dreams, I'm also actively asking them questions that I fully know they have no answers to, or questions that I know they probably haven't considered much, if at all. And that's really intentional and really purposeful because I know that students don't know what they don't know, right? And that's okay. But part of the journey for them is beginning to ask themselves these questions so that the wheels begin turning, right? I don't ever expect a student when I ask them a question about their future to give me an answer at the very moment. But if I can plant a seed that they can begin to really uh, foster and cultivate in the next coming weeks and months, then the conversations become more thoughtful. They become more purposeful. They're full, much more full of reflection and of intention. So making sure that sometimes, even if we want our children and our students to go down a particular path, it's better to give them the questions to lead them to that path so that they know and feel that they've had the agency to arrive at that place. So be really good and skilled about asking them these probing questions and leaving room and space for them to explore if there's uncertainty that exists. And as I've mentioned time and time again, exploration is so, so, so important, right? And I think this is the fun part of where we are at this part of the process. 
there's a lot of amazing opportunities out there. And we wanna make sure that we're giving students the, the option and the space to explore both near and far. Final lists aren't due to me in our office until November. So we have about seven and a half months for students to really think about what's right for them. And certainly we're gonna stagger that work differently depending on if your child is applying to colleges through an early program, depending on if your child is in, engaging with the international admissions process. And we'll work on that on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But I wanna say this, and it's affirming to students to hear this because there seems to be a sense of urgency that they need to have answers now. And depending on how you like to view time, this is either a little bit amount of time or there's a lot of time. And what I've told students on and on again is that there is plenty of time to make these considerations. As I've mentioned in the past, my big focus for all of my students is assuring that they finish off the school year as strongly as possible. And if that's our number one priority, that is absolutely fine. But what I wanna to stress today, and what I have stressed to our students as a collective, is that it's important to make time to really sit with each college that they're considering, because there's a lot of information that you have to consider. There's a lot of information that you have to digest. But if you take even an hour a week and spend your time fully vested in learning about one school or one particular opportunity, your students are gonna feel much, much more better about not only the options that are out there, but their ability to articulate what's important for them and how that's gonna be central in their search process. So as, so as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of opportunities out there, right? There's over 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States alone. So it can be easy and even tempting for students to let shiny marketing materials or really um, captivating admissions officers sell them on the idea of any particular university. And especially if a student hasn't given themselves the opportunity to really think about what it is that they want, it can be really easy to fall victim of, you know, following that shiny perspective, right? But as we're going through um, our junior seminars, as we've been having individual meetings with students, we really encourage students to take the time to reflect on their needs, their hopes, and their journey before diving into the college search process. If you've ever, and I think about this, you know, I always think about analogies to kind of think about how is it that we can introduce this process to, to children and, you know, Something that I thought about was, if you ever had a moment with your child where you asked them, what do you want for dinner? For them to say, I don't know. I, my mother is at the moment staying with me. I'm thinking about this a lot. I remember as a child, whenever she would ask me what I wanted for dinner, and I said, I don't know, she quipped back really eat quickly and said, well, this is not a restaurant. You don't get it your way. You either cook what I eat or you don't eat at all, which was <laughs> reflective of who my mother is as an individual, right? And it's pretty frustrating if, you, if you're trying to get a sense of what it is that your kid wants, probably makes your job a little easier, right? But without any direction, you may make whatever's on your heart for only them for to refuse it or to not eat or to complain. And I think that I think about the college process in a really similar way. If a child comes to me and asks for college recommendations, but is unable to articulate what it is they want, or better yet, what are they curious about? Even if I gave them a list of my favorite colleges or the colleges most popular at Brooklyn Friends School, those options may not resonate with the child. So it's important for us to get comfortable asking good questions of our students that are geared towards unearthing their understanding of their preferences so we can collectively work towards building a college list that is reflective of just that. I always like to give the visualization of this Venn diagram because every college has their own unique set of resources, experiences, and opportunities available to students including but not limited to things like majors, professors, research opportunities, traditions, athletics, you name it. However, for a college to be a good match, you have to consider if your child's needs and aspirations align with the opportunities available at that particular college. So when we talk about fit, we're talking about the tangible and the intangible ways that a number of institutions are gonna be um, good fits for your children considering the resources and the opportunities that are available for them. So a lot of our work is helping students move away from the idea of a college and the vision that they're creating for themselves with the college and really understanding what it is that's in front of them and the resources that they will have access to and the ways in which they're gonna be able to engage in ways that feel true to them with that particular community. And understanding that intersection takes a lot of time, takes a lot of reflection, 
And most importantly, it takes a quite a bit amount of research, right? So another way to also think about fit is if you think about all the preferences that you and your children may have regarding the college process, you can put them in kind of four broad buckets, personal, social, academic, and financial. And kind of like the infographic that I showed earlier, the sizes of these particular circles will depend on your children, their needs, and the specific needs of your families, right? But it's, it's a really helpful way to frame the kind of questions that you may be asking your children or to put into buckets the kinds of perspectives that they should be thinking about as they're researching different opportunities and understanding that there is space for all of these, right? And that these are all really important considerations to make and to balance against one another as you're thinking about what is an appropriate fit um, for your child. And we firmly believe that when you make it, when you're intentional about aligning your interests and values with the, that of the college, you'll have choices. You have really good choices. You have an abundance of choices. And those choices are going to help you understand that your child can be happy at multiple institutions if you're really holding center and really holding true their preferences and what it is that they need to be successful, to be happy, and to thrive. So as you're thinking about what information you have access to and how you can begin to really tackle this monstrosity of a process, there's a lot of resources that are available at home that you don't have to travel really far to get access to. And the first one that I wanna talk about is SCORE. Now, SCORE is a tool that we use to help process documentation and send them over to colleges. So there's a really important practical element of SCORE that we rely on in the college counseling office. But even if you think about those broad preferences that we, that we spoke about earlier today, SCORE has a search tool that allows you to do a quick, um, filtering of different priorities for your children and identify different colleges across the country, right? So you can filter out by size, academic program, location, um, and several other factors to give you a quick and dirty list of a school that meet those criteria. Again, it's a beginning point and could be complementary to the work that we're already doing with your children on a one-on-one -on -one basis. The FIS guide is also a really, really helpful resource that I particularly enjoy. So just to give you a little visual cue, this behemoth of a book is the FIS Guide. Um, it was offered to all students um, who are interested in receiving a copy of the 2023 edition. I still have um, not only 2023 guides, but 2022 guides in my office. So if you or your children are interested, please let me know, and I'm happy to share them um, this particular resource. It offers a page and a half guide on over 400 colleges across the country. It's again, as you can imagine, probably not going to be the most robust guide or the most complete guide. But even in the experience of uh, hosting the college tour this spring break, I read the reviews before and after the tour to kind of compare what it is that Fisk is giving with the experiences that we were observing. I think it was actually pretty balanced and pretty fair. So it's a good way just to have some introductory conversations to thumb through um, reviews and kind of overviews of a myriad of different institutions and certainly an easy way um, if there's colleges that perhaps Naomi and I have recommended to your child and you don't know much about this can be a really easy and quick way to begin having those conversations. Because of the pandemic um, and the lots of shifts that we've seen in college admissions I think one really positive thing that we've observed is that the need for virtual engagement and the ways in which admissions offices have been able to tap into communities that have historically been um, set aside or unvisited because the internet has kind of acted, if you have access to the internet, that is, as an equalizer of sorts and a democratization of information. So many, many, many colleges and universities continue to host virtual information sessions and virtual tours. And it's a really wonderful opportunity to learn about the school get very similar information than that what you, which you would receive if you're visiting the college and you never have to leave home. So for those schools that your child may be considering where you know you may not be able to visit or you may not have the time to visit right now, or maybe even you're thinking about visiting, but you're trying to still assess whether it's worth it or not, sit in on a virtual information session and get that broad overview of what and that college and university is. Certainly, the college's website is going to be the main source of inf information for those tours and those information sessions. 
but you visit is another website and another resource that has compiled a number of virtual tours for college campuses across the country. Um, it's a little it's a little hokey sometimes in, in the way that they present the information, but at least it gives you a visual cue of what these campuses look like, as well as some information about the buildings and the programs at the schools. Amazon has also have this really cool series called The College Tour. I think they're on their fifth or sixth season, and it's an hour-long program that sh showcases a variety of different institutions of a variety, variety of different scopes across the country. Um, it's really, really good. It's, I think, kind of a college tour 2.0 because they do a lot of student interviews, a lot of interviews with administrators and professors. Um, so I highly recommend checking that out. There's some really good information out there. But the number one resource and the resource that will be the most valuable to you and your child, especially at this juncture, but definitely at the time that they begin writing their college application are college websites themselves. These are the primary sources your source of information about everything that's happening at that particular college. And what I encourage you all to think about and to look into is certainly the admissions off websites to get tangible information about how and when to apply and things of that nature, but know that we're gonna support you in that endeavor as well. But moving beyond that and really trying to understand the heart and the soul of these institutions, right? If you if you were drawn to Brooklyn Friends and you love Brooklyn Friends and your child appreciates the school because of who we are as a community and our mission and our and our values and the ways in which that permeates throughout the experience here, then I encourage you to do the same and look at the, the college's missions, their core values, and maybe even their future plans as an understanding of who they are, where they've been, and where they're going. And you'd be surprised how much rich information you can get from that. This isn't something that maybe resonates with all students, but as, as you think about being partners in this process and information that you can glean on behalf of your child, this can add some really rich perspectives and add some really interesting dimension to your conversation about any number of colleges out there. As your child is considering what their potential fields of studies are or they may be, it's really important to get comfortable looking and researching and diving into academic departments of interest, right? And seeing the breadth and depth of academic opportunities that are available for your child. As I've mentioned in this session, as I've mentioned in meetings, for me, it's not about the child who knows 1000% what they want. And if that's your kid, that's amazing. It makes this process a little bit easier if they go into a really certain lens about an academic interest and what they wanna study. But so many of our students and so many young people at this juncture don't know, and that's okay. And we don't have to pressure them to make a decision, not at this point especially, but what I always encourage students to think about are their curiosities. What is it that they like to learn more about? If they had the opportunity and the free time, what really activates them to know more? What are those questions that they've been asking themselves that they've returned back to either in their classes, conversations with their peers or conversations with you all that they can investigate further and perhaps more meaningfully while in college, right? The structure of a high school is going to be pretty limiting and it's not going to expose our children to the myriad of opportunities available for study at colleges, but if they get comfortable looking at the list of majors and the list of courses that are available, then I think students begin to think about more broadly what their interests are and make some really inter interesting connections about the future and what could be, right? So as they're looking and understanding these academic departments in greater depth, it's really also helpful and important to think about the faculty members who are gonna be there and understanding that these are gonna be adults who will not only lead their classes, but become, but maybe their academic advisors, could become their mentors, could be people who are connecting them to job opportunities or internship placements, right? So much like your children talk about the connections and the relationships that they've built with adults here at Brooklyn Friends, encourage them to think and project into the future about some adults that they may get excited about when they're on the college campus. And it doesn't have to be just faculty members, but it can definitely get them excited about the people who are gonna be teaching their classes and it's one purview into that particular academic institution. And certainly, research opportunities, and more importantly, or more specifically rather, is really looking at that course catalog. So if you've ever tried 
to navigate a college website on your own or support your child in this process, you will notice very quickly, some colleges have beautifully designed websites, make a whole lot of sense. You can find information really quickly. Other colleges, not so much so. It makes They make it really challenging to find the basic information. And that's the reality of kind of what we have to deal with, right? But the best tool and the best resource I would, would uh, share with students is that if they're looking at a college and they know what they wanna study and they wanna look at the list of courses available, go on Google, uh, type in the name of the college and add on course catalog. Hamilton College, course catalog. University of Michigan, course catalog. Wesleyan University, course catalog. It's the easiest way to find that um, collection of courses and course descriptions for what's offered for students at the very moment. And this exercise is really, really, really important for multiple reasons. In a pragmatic end, in the fall, when students begin to write their college supplements, a common question that they're gonna be asked is, why do you wanna attend our institution? And the majority of this answer has to be grounded in their academic aspirations and not only articulating what their academic interests and curiosities are, but to demonstrate that they've done their homework and they understand the resources available at the school and they can talk about and write to the resources that most excite them or most activate them to learn more. And in part, doing so is finding out the courses that are available to them, right? So I was a sociology major in college, so I didn't go to Hamilton, but just for the sake of this exercise, pulled up a few courses that really resonated with me and I think my 17 year old's vision of myself and still ring true to my interests and the things that I like to know and the things that I like to learn. So as you read course descriptions, what I encourage students to think about is what sounds interesting? What are those moments that make you go, hmm? What makes you curious to learn more? And to take note of this, right? Because this is how you begin to move from the abstract idea of a college to the concrete opportunities that each college is going to offer. And when you look at this level of detail, you can then more easily understand the differences between academic opportunities from college to college. Some colleges and some institutions like Hamilton may have majors where the, it's by design intended for students to become generalists, right? Give you a broad overview of that particular discipline, and perhaps you can kind of pick and choose courses that most align with your interests or not, right? The decision is yours, but the idea is that you're getting a really kind of broad overview of what this particular academic discipline is. And that's okay. And that works well for some students. For others, they're looking for more depth, right? So maybe they know exactly within sociology what specifically they wanna do. And as they're evaluating different ac academic opportunities, they wanna make sure that there is an abundance of courses relative to that particular concentration or more specific field of study within that particular major. So as an example, at a school like Northwestern, students are able to concentrate more specifically within uh, the sociology major and they can study fields such as environment and society, social data research, social inequality, sociology of health, medicine and sciences, sociology of law, and urban sociology, right? So some schools, because of their size, because of their specializations, or because of their academic offerings may offer students the ability to, concent to pick a concentration within a particular academic division. Again, for some students, that is the right path because they have very specific interests. For other students, they just might love the idea of having more choice, right? But having these conversations with your child will become increasingly more important as they're thinking and evaluating academic fit, right? Um, I think for some students, this part of the search may feel too soon. Maybe they're not ready to engage in this conversation just yet. Maybe they still need the space to just think about the college as a whole. But this is the work that we are slowly building them towards. So getting them comfortable with these resources will be really helpful. And for you all, I think it also, can also be helpful too to know, again, the access to information and the access of experiences that your child will have at a number of different institutions. So we also, as we're thinking and exploring different um, resources within a college's website, you also wanna make sure that you're looking really closely at student life, right? So going back to that 
diagram about fit, the social elements are also really important, right? We don't wanna minimize that a student is going to college to study something and earn a degree. And that's certainly really important and will be an important way of how they articulate fit for the college. But we also recognize that your child will be living there for four years, that this is going to be an extension of their home, that they're gonna find friends, they're gonna find extended family, maybe they'll find love, who knows, right? But we wanna make sure that all parts of their selves are represented and reflected in these communities. And that the ways that they like to engage with their peers, the ways that they like to engage with their communities, the way that they like to engage with nature or cities, you name it, those are always just as important to ask your child about. And sometimes it may be awkward to have a conversation with an adult like myself um, about, you know, how do you want to spend your weekend, right? Like that's a kind of weird question for me to ask. And I don't expect students to answer that question for me, right? But you should ask them that and withhold judgment as much as you can with whatever questions and responses they give you. Or if they don't answer, at least give them the kind of leeway to say, these are things you should be thinking about because you have to lead a life that you're gonna be happy with. You wanna be in a community where you feel fulfilled because if those things and those needs are met, I can assure you that the academic pieces will come together as well, right? I know a lot of students, and I've met many students in my career who have ended up at institutions that sound sexy and sound like the right place, but they're really struggling to make connection. They're really struggling to make community. And for some, they you know got smart and they left. And for others, they decided for a number of reasons to stay, but their college experience felt lacking because that part of them didn't feel fulfilled. So make sure that you're also encouraging your child to spend some time on the Student Life website to understand the clubs, the organizations, the athletics, the service opportunities, the traditions that exist at these schools, and importantly, to take stock of what feels and what resonates as it being important. Another really important resource, and I would say that this is where you all can come in and really dig deeper than perhaps what your child may want to do on their own, but is looking really closely at the career services website for each of the colleges that your child is considering, right? You wanna really make sure that these are gonna be places that are gonna set your child up for success, we wanna make sure that these are places that can prepare your child for the workforce and that they have an abundance of opportunities for their students to connect with different employers, either across the country, uh, regionally, or even amongst their alumni base. So I really, really actively encourage you to take some time, look at their career services department, because especially if, as you're thinking about financing your child's education, and perhaps you're thinking about return on investment and you're trying to figure out what feels right for your child, I think this is an important and very real conversation to have. And more specifically, there, there's a resource um, that has slightly different names that I wanna center. Um, some schools are gonna call this their postgraduate plans. Others may call it their postgraduate outcomes, hiring reports, industry reports. They have a number of different names for profiles and survey data that they're collecting from graduates six months after graduation that give an insight as to what it is that the students are doing six months after they graduate, right? And they're typically posting information such as average salary, uh, full-time employment rate, graduation or prof uh, graduate professional school programs, folks who are still seeking opportunities, so on and so forth, right? So these two are just two examples of the kinds of data points that you may have access to. Again, some schools make this, this um, information really easy to find. Others, you have to go digging. Being a, Google, a skilled Google researcher can be really helpful to find these things quickly. But in these two examples, this is a sampling of hiring um, companies for the class for the students at Rensselaer Polytech Institute for the class of 2022. So you get to get to see the industries in which their graduates are going into. And on the right is the class profile for Boston University for the class of 2021. And it gives some really interesting information about average salaries for across their different divisions, such as the School of Fine Arts, uh, College of Arts and Sciences, their business school, engineering, so on and so forth, right? As of everything, you take this for what it is. You know that there's a lot more stories than data that can present onto its own but it can be really good information, especially if there's schools that your child is considering or schools that we're recommending that you don't know a ton about, this can be a really good resource to, to, to affirm that your child is thinking about the right thing 
or it may raise up some more questions that you may want to talk about in individual meetings. Lastly, um, a couple other resources that I want to make note of. Social media is kind of um, the one we love to hate, right? The one where I wish that students would really take more time in actively researching the websites of these colleges. But the time that I hear students tell me, Frank, I heard this on TikTok, or I read about this on Instagram, or I saw this on YouTube, and that is influencing the way that they're experiencing these universities. And instead of fighting it, I think we need to embrace it and help our students kind of complicate their understanding of what social media can be. They're gonna be on it, they're going to look at it, they're going to think about it. So let's do that with them, help them understand what they're seeing, helping them understand that the views that they may be observing is coming from one particular person. So we always have to take it over a grain of salt. But it's a great way and a really powerful tool to get a sense of what campus is like right now. What's happening right now? What are students getting excited about right now? What are they posting about? And this is gonna reveal everything, the good, the bad, and everything in between. It's all valid. It's all a part of a suite of tools that I hope you're, you and your children are accessing as you're thinking about different opportunities. Similar to social media, one of my favorite resources are our campus newspapers. And anytime I'm on a college campus, the first thing I try to do is pick up the newspaper and see what's going on, right? I mean, it's always interesting from a journalism perspective just to see how students are writing and what they're writing about. But honestly, kind of like social media, you're getting an unfiltered view of the issues that matter on these particular campuses, right? So you're hearing about great things. You're hearing about amazing speakers and amazing events. You're reading profiles about really interesting students who are doing incredible work, but you're also hearing about the bad things, an incident that happened on campus, spoke striking or wanting to unionize at a particular school or any of the other challenges that a, a particular community is facing, right? No college is perfect. I can say that with a lot of certainty. And every college is going to have its issues. But as your children are thinking about and as you're thinking about what's the right fit for them, you also have to think about and balance, is this something that you feel your child is ready for and is comfortable stepping into, right? So having these honest conversations can be really, really important. But as you're trying to get a sense of what is the day-to-day -day experience like, what is the culture like of a particular school, spend some time in their newspapers, and I think you would unearth, unearth some really interesting information. So all of that is within access to your fingertips. You don't have to leave home. You can get a lot of information just on the internet, right? But for those of you who are maybe ready for more in-person engagement, there's a lot that can be done. So the first, as I mentioned, will likely be college information sessions, and these may happen either on the college campus, they may happen in New York City, and in the fall, they will happen at Brooklyn Friends School right? There's going to be a lot of opportunities for engagement and for programming that colleges are going to open up to prospective students. Certainly, if you are visiting a college campus, it makes sense to sit in an information session um, to really get that broad overview of the school and sit in on a, on a participate in a campus tour. But especially in the spring and fall, so really kind of going into tomorrow of our college fair and into May, and certainly back up again in September and October, admissions officers are gonna be out on the road, hosting evening programs um, at schools, at local hotels, at other university sponsored centers, um, and can be opportunities for you to go and learn more about any particular institution. So as you are receiving invitations, please um, think about going them. They might be really good information, especially if it's a school that you're on the fence about, that you need to learn more about, or it's a school that you're thinking about potentially visiting in the future. While you're on campus, maximize your time there. Every school is gonna offer a slightly different experience. Most are gonna offer an information session. Most are gonna offer a tour. But some schools may also offer the opportunity for something more specialized. Maybe they give you the opportunity for your child to sit in on a class and experience a number of classes in real time at a college campus. If you're going to a large university that has multiple colleges within the university, Perhaps they have specialized tours where you'll get to see the engineering school or the business school or the school of fine arts. And if that aligns with your child's interest, make sure they see that because those may be spaces on campus where they'll spend a significant amount of time on. And that may be more pertinent to them than a broad overview of what this university has to offer. 
Connecting with current students, admissions officers, faculty, and staff could also be another added layer that you can add on to your experience there. Certainly, you could, this can take uh, shape as a formal interview. Some colleges do offer on-campus interviews with either a current senior or an admissions officer. And typically, not always, but typically these are more informational, right? An opportunity for students to talk to a real person one-on-one, -on -one, gather some information, and ask questions. It's not a moment that's, it's not a gotcha moment. It's not an evaluative interview. Most of those tend to be informative. But if the college does offer an in-person interview, absolutely take them up on that offer. And if your child needs some support, we're happy to help coach them through that. Um, I also encourage you all that as you're having conversations in particular about academic interests, if your child has identified a department or even a professor of interest, reach out and ask them if there's an opportunity for you to connect with a professor, an administrator, or a student within that particular department. In my experience, I think that professors are pretty open to meeting and connecting with prospective students if you extend that olive branch, right? And again, at, you're on a fact-finding mission. You're on a, on, a, on a mission to figure out fit. And is this the good, a right place for the child? Is this gonna find their mentors and other caring adults? This could be a really, really, really great place to kind of tap into and research to tap into and definitely trying to make the time that um, if you have the time and you can to make connections with them. But also think about this pretty broadly, right? It may not be just professors. Perhaps your child has um, learning differences and you wanna connect with a learning specialist on campus. Make sure that you are taking time to visit the office of, and this is being called many, many different things. Perhaps it's called Office of, of Learning Support, Office of Dis uh, Student Disability Needs, kind of comes with a lot of different titles, but make time to go seek, speak with them. If financial aid is something that you have lots of questions about, make sure that you speak, take some time and schedule a meeting with financial aid officers. If um, affinity groups are of interest to you and if affinity spaces are gonna be important parts of your child's search, talk to those administrators. And having worked at Penn, having been involved in La Casa Latina and the LGBTQ plus center, that's always two resources that I always made sure that prospective students had access to because those will be, for many students, extensions of their homes, extensions of themselves and important communities for them to tap into, right? So definitely if there are identities that your child carries, if there's special communities or special programming that your child is interested in, make sure that while you're on campus, try to make connections because again, it'll help your child feel more settled in the decision about whether that school is a good fit or not. And I think for you all, it's that added comfort of knowing someone has my child's back. If something happens, I've made connection with another adult who's there and I can trust their energy. I know who they are and I feel really good about that, right? I encourage you to do that at all stages of the process from beginning your research to this time next year when your child's deciding where to enroll at find those adults that can be really good advocates and supporters for them. And then most importantly, approach someone in the quad. Nine times out of 10, I tell this to students and they look at me like I have seven heads, like how dare you, I would never do that, that's so cringy. No, no, no. And I get it, I don't think I would have done that as a 17 year old, but maybe your child will, or maybe you will, and you will be the person happily going up to students on the campus and just asking them questions about their experiences. College students are really friendly. And if they love their college experience, they want you to get excited as excited as they are. And that's always been my experience. So never fear kind of just tapping a random student and asking them questions and seeing what they get. You never know. Um, and as I mentioned, spaces that matter to you, you know, there may be some restrictions because of COVID and COVID protocols about the public and who can access what spaces, but always ask and see where you can get with that particular institution. So a couple of resources that I always tell students and families to be wary of, forums and spaces like College Confidential, which I don't think students use that anymore. I keep on mentioning it and they look at me like I'm nuts. Like I'm talking about MySpace, like, oh, this is so foreign for them. But Reddit definitely I think is another space where a lot of students get information. It's really easy to go down a rabbit hole of bad information, of unsubstantiated information, or what I tend to find that tends to be really destructive are those threads that are saying, you know, rate my chances. So there's students who are posting their courses, posting their GPAs, their extracurriculars, and then asking the public 
to ask them, you know, am I going to be competitive for X, Y, and Z schools? And 17 year olds are not admissions officers and the internet is not a kind place. And this is not where I would get any information that I would rely on in any way, shape or form. But honestly, even our, our most aware of students, the insecurities can get the best of them and they fall susceptible to this kind of information. So just make sure that if you know your child frequents these websites or is picking up some interesting facts that you're like, where are you getting this from? But if this is where they are, that you're having a conversation with them about being discerning and really um, being thoughtful of how they're kind of sourcing information. Um, connected to connected to that idea and connected to social media, you know, if you're on YouTube, you, you're going to see a bunch of videos that say how I got into X college or how I got my child into this particular school or something along those lines. And it might be media, it might be articles, and it might be whatever. Be very cautious of that as well. Again, this is a process that feels very opaque to the outsider, right? Because you never know why you got in. No one will ever tell you why you were admitted to a particular institution. We wouldn't tell you why we were admitted to Brooklyn Friends. Your children will not know why they were admitted into a particular college. We can only speculate, right? And this is why it feels as an outsider so random. But as someone who's worked in admissions and kind of knows how the sausage is made, it's far from random. It's actually very, very, very purposeful and very, very, very intentional. But if you don't have full answers as to why something happened, you're going to make assumptions and you're going to create narratives that make you feel good about yourself. And for those who are promoting these ideas, I tend to think that that tends to be more destructive and harmful than productive and helpful. So if you see those videos, just again, watch them if you so feel compelled over a grain of salt. When you're looking at social media, definitely lots of colleges operate and own their own social media accounts. So just like any good marketer, you're going to see the the best of the best, the glitz and the glam, the very nice pictures, the very happy children. But that's often not who the children are following on social media. They may be following other students. They may be following student organizations. And as everything, just be cautious. One student's perspective should not summate, summarize an entire community's experiences. So just make sure that your children are actively aware of that. And of course, kind of connected to the second point, your neighbor's best friend's cousin cat who lives across the door who got their child into college 20 years ago, right? Again, a lot of the information, good intention, good hearts, speculative at best, not really applicable to the kind of process that your child will go to. If you ever have questions, if you ever have concerns, if you ever have fears and anxieties, please come and speak to me. Please come to speak to Naomi. I'd rather you do that and rely on third, fourth, or fifth hand information that's just not necessarily helpful. And lang lastly, our rankings, things like US News and World Reports, Niche, the Princeton Review. Listen, we all fall victim to them. We all look at them. We're all curious about what these particular rankings are saying and what do they mean and are they valid? And do we give them too much credit? And do they actually matter? And will it matter where your child goes to college? depending on the, their career aspects and all of that, right? I think because we have these questions and we have these anxieties, these rankings exist, but rankings are really flawed. There's a lot of interesting pieces that go into, for instance, the US News and World Reports that you may not necessarily assume to be an important factor to measure the, the wealth, the health of a college, right? So, you know, for instance, alumni contributing to the college is a part of the rankings, right? So you may think, oh, well, you know, Maybe that says something. And for my friends here who work in development or advancement, maybe maybe it's more important than I'm assuming it to be. But there's so much more that goes to an experience that ranking cannot always capture. And as we've seen, there's certain institutions that um, do pretty unethical things to get higher rankings, right? So I was perusing this, um, I was perusing the US News and World Report a couple of weeks ago out of curiosity because I remember the fall back from Columbia University last year who got caught fudging their numbers, you know, and they were ranked second, I think, in US News and World Report, and now they're ranked 18th, right? Ooh. Is it a is it a oh. fundamentally different institution? I'd argue probably not, right? Columbia is what Columbia has always been, but this impacts kind of how folks view them in the outside world. And some folks are gonna really hold that to gospel. So I just want you to just be mindful that if you are looking at these things, again, as of anything of data, interrogate, 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 and search for deeper meaning. If you're a data head and you really love these kind of statistics, other metrics that I would encourage you to think about are graduation rates, right? So our students 
I think the national graduation rate may be about in the 40s. I don't want to be quoted on that. But our students graduating at really high rates, that really has a lot to say about success and student academic success at that particular institution. Look at retention rates. Are kids coming back into their sophomore year or are they flocking out of there from year to year? You want to have look at uh, data points such as average indebtedness, right, or average cost, especially as you're having conversations about affordability. What is it that this university or the college is doing to ensure a student's financial health, given the resources that they have available for them? And one really pressing topic and one that can be pretty charged. And, you know, I have a lot of friends who are recent PhD grads who are in the job market right now, and it's really, really hard, are the percent of full-time faculty members, right? Are the folks there going to be there for the time for a long time? Or do we have a lot of lecturers who are coming in and out of the university? Again, that's neither here nor there, but something to consider and something to think about, especially with the evolving landscape of higher education. But these can be other data points as you're looking to complicate this idea of rankings that you may want to consider for yourself. Now, the kind of final resource that I want to offer you all, um, and I'm going to I know this is a little hard to see and I'm gonna drop this on the chat box and I would send it to you all via email, so don't worry, but it's about organization, right? We talked a lot today. If you were to leave this call and say, let me go back, pick any random college and let me try to find out as much as I can in an hour, I promise you, you won't be like you've learned that much, right? Because it's just a lot of information. But even then, how do you tackle this massive website that has abundance of resources and information, right? It really does begin by helping you and helping your child ask these bigger, broader questions that can help them filter out the noise, filter out the information and seek out what's most important for them. So when, we, when the students had our, this particular session a couple of weeks ago, we had them pretend to be college counselors. So they were Frank and Naomi for the day. And we gave them a fictitious scenario of Pearl the Panther, who's going to college, who has all these interests. And we think Wesleyan could be a good fit for Pearl. And now you have to help Pearl understand why. So we tasked the students to look at different elements of the university's website to kind of create a case about why Wesleyan could be a good fit for Pearl the Panther. So some students focus on the academics, others focus on student life, others focused on um, career opportunities and to really get them just comfortable navigating websites, right? And what I've heard from that experience with students time and time again is that it was helpful, it was overwhelming and man, does this take a lot of time, right? And I think we had about 30 minutes to complete this exercise and folks were just barely scratching the surface. So it is, so I wanna validate that this is gonna take time, intention and energy but one way and one tool that we've created is a spreadsheet to help students organize their thoughts and organize their information. Because the most important thing that they can do right now is keep notes of everything they're learning about, everything they're experiencing, and everything they're feeling as they're experiencing and, and interacting with different colleges. Because this will come up again. This will come up in supplements. This is gonna come up in preparation for their interviews. This may even come up in conversations between us, kind of helping students understand why they want to apply to particular schools, or maybe even making decisions about where to apply early, for instance, or maybe even why or where to enroll at, in the, um, again, a year from now, right? So every student will organize information in the way that makes most sense for them, we are not suggesting that this is the only way to centralize information, but we wanna give students a helpful tool to begin plunking in their perspectives and what they're learning about. And what our hope is that as they're populating this particular spreadsheet, it gives them a visual cue to see the differences from school to school, help them notice patterns between the things that they like, the things that stand out for them and what resonates for them. And ultimately, will help them filter their list out and really, really whittle it down, right? All of our students are kind of starting from a really, really broad perspective. And in the months coming ahead, towards the end of the summer, to the end of the semester, into the summer and into the fall, we're working to whittle that list down little or smaller and smaller and smaller, smaller until we land at a good place with the number of schools that your child is most excited about. So with that being said, um, I am going to stop my screen share I am going to open up the floor for any questions, concerns, considerations that you may have. Feel free to um, drop them in the chat box. Feel free to um, pop in into the call. Um, 
and I, I will leave it open for you all. DC, you're up. Hi, Frank. Thank you. Uh, um, I came a little late, so maybe you said this already, but um, are you going to share that spreadsheet with us? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, so what I'll do is um, when I email tomorrow, I will email the spreadsheet, this mm -hmm. recording, and I will also send over every recording of these past seminars because I recognize that we send a lot of emails at the Brooklyn Friends School and Frank Cabrera sends a lot of emails too. So just to make it a little easier for you all, I will centralize all that information. So be on the lookout for that tomorrow. Thanks. And I had one more question. So when you're looking at things like retention, you know, graduation rates, aren't, isn't that really about class? You know, like <laughs> I think CUNY across the CUNY colleges, I think the graduation rate is something like 60% or something like mm -hmm. that. And like mm -hmm. 40 so which it which sounds kind of low, but then it's like you know it's a, just a different demographic. It's you know kids who have to work full time or support their families or you know maybe have children of their own. So I'm wondering how to read that when you're thinking about elite schools, you know, because mm -hmm. that just it just looks like it's replicating you know the privileged kind of people that go to those schools. Yeah, Cece, I think I think this is an excellent question that you raise, and I think actually. One of the inherent flaws with reporting and data, especially when it comes to completion rates and graduation rates, because I, if, from my understanding, and I am someone who's very curious about this field, but I, I would not go as far as say I'm an expert, but with places like CUNY, as an example, or even community colleges, there's a lot of movement that happens, right? Just because a, just because a student did not complete their time at that institution does not mean that they didn't graduate from college. Right. So a two year school may have a low completion rate, but that's because students may transfer out. That's com that's community college by design. Right. For the CUNY schools, I think that's part of it, too. Students may start there, but they may transfer out and they may transfer out for whatever reason it may be. Right. So there's a lot more that goes into it that just isn't neatly captured, which is why it's always important to interrogate and ask these kinds of questions and ask what else is behind the methodology of these reporting structures and what's going into them, what's missing, what's left out, and to kind of continue to ch push and challenge, right? Um, because even in an information session for an elite institution, if you hear something, like ask. <laughs> and sometimes the admissions officer does not have an answer or they don't want to tell you the complete answer, um, but they're always going to use data that's going to paint them in the best possible picture. But there's always a backstory that complicates what's happening. Um, and it's always good to ask those clarifying questions. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions? Yeah. All right. It is 731. I'm a minute beyond time. I thank you all, as always, for your time, for your attention, for your energy. Um, if there are questions that come up, please, you know where to find me. You, need to, you know where to find Naomi. Until next week, have a good evening, everyone, and I'll see you around. Take good care. Thank you so Thanks, much. Frank. Bye.